welcome to Aaron Crichton from McMaster's University, who are going to speak about McIntyre's theorem in Isabel Sachal. Thank you. Um, is, is everybody able to hear me okay? Yes, we hear you, yes. Okay, great, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so uh, my name's Aaron, and yeah, the topic of my talk is uh, McIntyre's theorem in Isabel Hall. Uh, so that specifically is, uh, I'm gonna be talking about a project where I formalized a, a theorem from model theory, a quantifier elimination theorem um, in, in a, a proof assistant so that they can sort of produce a machine checkable uh, a proof of uh, what was previously, I guess, just sort of written on paper and nowhere else. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'm having some control issues. Uh, okay, so so my, my talk today, uh, it's kind of kind of have three parts to it. So so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the the Isabel Hall theorem proving uh, system, and so how how you can use Isabel to to prove theorems and formalize concepts uh, from from ordinary mathematics. Uh, then I'm just going to talk very briefly about about McIntyre's theorem and and the different ways that that it can be proved. Um, and and McIntyre's theorem by that I mean McIntyre's quantifier elimination theorem for for the p-adic field, uh, which which I think most of the audience uh, should be pretty familiar with today. Uh, and then finally I'll get into um, it won't really be anything like a comprehensive outline uh, of what into of, of of sort of what I what I did in formalizing McIntyre's theorem, but more just a bit of a discussion about about the different kinds of challenges that one encounters when you're trying to when you're trying to formalize a theorem like McIntyre's theorem in uh, in in a language like Isabel. Uh, so, <laughs> just start off with a picture of the final goal. Right, so uh, the, this is McIntyre's theorem expressed in the language Isabel, uh, with its well, the, the proof is longer than seventy-one lines, um, but but the the sort of final proof, I guess, was just that long. Um, but, but but this is what it looks like uh, formulated in in the language. Um, okay, so so we'll start off with just some general discussion about like what what Isabel actually is as a tool. Uh, so so Isabel is what we call an interactive theorem prover. Um, so, so it's sort of like a, like a programming language uh, with, with a, a software suite that comes with it where, where someone can, can express logical concepts uh, in, a, in a language, and then they can also produce proofs that, that Isabel is able to check the, uh, the validity of automatically. And then sort of the final goal is that you can, you can formalize things from mathematics, express theorems, and then, and then write down proofs of theorems in a way that, that the machine can check. Um, and, and so the variant that I'm gonna use, so there's this distinction between Isabel, which is like a very, very general uh, proof assistant tool, and then Isabel Hall, which is sort of a version of Isabel that allows you to formulate things in a kind of higher order logic. Uh, so to start off, I'll just like give a little bit of an overview of some of the stuff that's been done in Isabel up till now. So, so many, many people have used uh, Isabel tools to formalize different theorems, sort of you know, just popular theorems from general mathematics. Um, and, and those are compiled somewhere called the Archive of Formal Proofs, which is an online database that just consisting of, of proofs that people have done in Isabel, which you can sort of download and import, and you can then use those things that they've proved in, in proving your own theorems. Uh, so, so just a, a very, very small list of, of some results that have been put into the Archive of Formal Proofs. So famously, the Kepler conjecture uh, proved by Thomas Hales is in there. Uh, this sort of has the distinction of being, uh, to my knowledge, the only theorem whose only proof, uh, or at least only complete proof, has been done by way of formalization in Isabel. Um, and then some others are Goodall's completeness theorem, prime number theorem, um, Jordan curve theorem, uh, consistency of axiom of choice. So, so just the point is there's quite a bit in there, and people have done a lot of interesting stuff. Although uh, when, when I first heard about it, uh, my first thought was, well, <laughs> is there any model theory in there? Uh, and, and at least at the time when I, when I first encountered Isabel, the, the answer was no. Um, and, and so I took on this project. Okay, so I'll just give a little bit of a sort of like technical overview of just like sort of what, what does it mean to, to formalize something in Isabel or what does that look like? So, so every proof in Isabel is organized into a sort of module called a theory. Uh, so, so a theory is a, a document that, that has a name, 
and may import other theories. And then the body of it just consists of expressions of definitions, theorems, and theorems proofs. Um, and so of course this, this import part is important because otherwise it would be very hard to do anything. So, so you can just, if you have, if you have a well, a well composed uh, Isabel proof of a certain fact that you've gotten from somewhere like the archive of formal proofs, you're welcome to import that and use it in your own proofs. Um, so I haven't really said much yet about what these proofs actually look like. Um, so we'll see maybe be a couple of fragments of examples today to sort of hint at it, but, but proofs of theorems in Isabel kind of come in two flavors. One is what we call sort of applicative proofs where you've got a result and um, that, that result is sort of, first it's the goal that you're trying to prove and then you can apply different theorems to that result to manipulate what's called a proof state. So, so for example, if you're trying to prove some conclusion, but you know that conclusion is implied by some other theorem, um, well, you can imply that, you know, apply that implication to sort of shift your goal now. If A implies B, uh, I can apply that rule and then my goal shifts from B to A. And sort of by, by sophisticated application of rules like this, we can eventually sort of reduce a, a theorem down to true. Um, and, and then, so, the, this applicative style is, is kind of useful, but often produces proofs that, that are very hard to read. And so Isabel also offers something called ESAR, which is a structured proof language where you can kind of write out proofs that, that moderately closely resemble the sort of thing that, uh, that you might write in a math paper or something, um, sort of you know, with, within certain uh, confines and, and produce proofs that way as well. Um, Okay, so just to sort of quickly go through a few more sort of technical backgrounds. So, so Isabel is a is a logical language where you can you know you can define define things and and prove theorems, and that it has a type system for doing that. So, so when you're trying to express things in Isabel, uh, every object has a certain type, and the type system in Isabel sort of consists of like base types that sort of come predefined, such as natural numbers, booleans, uh, type constructors. So you can take a type and turn it into sort of a, a new type by taking lists of Booleans or sets of Booleans. Um, you can build new types from old ones with functions. Um, and then also there, there's sort of this, this support for a kind of type polymorphism where we can define things that have type variables. So, so I can define a function that, that acts on lists of some unspecified type and then produce like new lists of that, that unspecified type. Uh, but the important thing I wanna say about types in Isabel um, that, that sort of dip, is a point where it differs from other sort of common theorem provers out there, such as Lean or Coke, is that Isabel lacks support for dependent types. Uh, so if I want to define a new type in Isabel, uh, what I can't do is sort of define that type in terms of an object level parameter. Uh, so, so for example, if, if someone wanted to construct a type in Isabel for n by n matrices or, or five by five matrices, let's say, and then prove a theorem about them, uh, that will not be possible uh, if they're sort of passing that parameter five a, as an object itself. Um, and so this sort of creates certain constraints uh, for, for how you can formalize things in this language. Okay, so given, having given sort of very brief overview there, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, how people in practice uh, actually formulate and, uh, and prove things about abstract algebra in Isabel, which is uh, what, what I'm doing here. So, so we don't have dependent types. Uh, so if we want to construct in Isabel certain, uh, you know, let's say a, a group or a ring or something, um, you, you can't do that in every case by way of sort of constructing that group or ring as a type in your language. Um, so instead, uh, you can construct these algebraic things as objects instead. Uh, and then that's done using a certain construction in Isabel called records. Um, so records basically allow you to construct algebraic objects as just sort of tuples. Right? You'll see in standard algebra textbooks, people will often say things like a ring is a tuple consisting of a set and addition operation and multiplication and constants zero and one. Well, well records are sort of a formalization of that, that kind of intuition for what a structure is. Um, so let's actually take a look at a little, uh, some examples of Isabel code uh, that, that can be used to define record types. So um, in, in the Hall Algebra Library, sort of the most basic kind of record that we consider is what they call a partial object. And a partial object is a record that just carries the data of a single set. 
which we call the carrier of the structure, um, then, then that records also have the property that they can be extended. So, so the, the partial object record can be extended uh, to, to what we call a monoid record, right? And this is sort of the, the data structure that holds what we would call a monoid in algebra. So, so a, a, a monoid record holds the data of a set, and it also holds the data of a multiplication operation and a, a constant, which is named one. And then of course, we could even further uh, extend that to, to give us the, the record for a ring. So that extends the monoid record to also include a field for zero and, and for addition. So importantly, these are just data structures and these are how sorry, we build so, algebraics. Oh. I'm sorry to interrupt you, there is a question. Oh, sure, yes. Hi, Aaron. Yeah, I just wanted to ask when you put in here your, your record of a, of, the, of a set to be, you've got um, uh, apostrophe A, are you specifying the type of the objects in that set? Or are you saying, oh. or is that actually a variable there? Yeah, so, so actually what that is, is a type variable. So, so we're defining an, at an A partial object, which is a partial object over the type A, and that consists of the data of a set of type A. And, and so this can be instantiated so A can for, actually, A can vary. A can vary, right? So you, you can have a partial object that consists of a set of integers. You could have a partial object that consists of a set of sets of real numbers and, and so I, on. I guess my question is that when you specify this, do you have to, you have to specify that it is a set of integers or do you have to say it's a set of some things and I don't, haven't yet said what they are? Right, so, so what you're seeing here, this defines a, a type of an A partial object. And if I want to, so that, that is a, a, a broad type of object in Isabel. If I want to instantiate a, a particular one, then it will be for a particular type. But, but being able to do it this way, I can sort of specify what we mean by a ring. And then, and then that ring can be populated later on with elements of any kind of type at all. So I can make a ring can, where the objects are integers, I can make a ring where the objects are equivalence classes of pairs of integers if I wanted to construct the rational numbers and, and so on. Does Thank that you. make sense? Yep. So yeah, so far we've basically just talked about sort of the, the data structures that Isabel supports for building up algebraic structures, but, but there's no real axiomatic assumptions here. Right? There's nothing stopping me from building a ring object that, that just isn't a ring at all, where, where the, the zero object doesn't behave like the zero, where the multiplication is not associative, things like that. Um, so, so Isabel has a different sort of structure for, for handling axiomatic assumptions, and those are called locales. So, so a locale is, is sort of in a, in a slogan like a persistent proof context. So, so in Isabel, you can specify a locale by saying, okay, here, the, the, this locale context is going to have a certain fixed object in the background, um, and that object is going to have certain properties. Um, and, and then once you've defined a locale, you can then formulate new definitions and new theorems uh, within that context that, that use those sort of background assumptions. And, and a really useful thing about locales is that you can do something like, I'm going to have a locale for an object which is a ring, uh, like, a, like a ring structure, and satisfies the ring axioms. Then later on, if I have um, a certain a certain structure that I've constructed uh, some other way, and I can prove in Isabel that that object is a ring, then I can immediately kind of import that locale context to this object, and then all those theorems I proved in general about rings now they apply apply to that concrete thing. So just to give another example, uh, building on what we saw before of like what, a, of what the locale for a monoid might look like. So a monoid locale, it, it fixes a structure G and that, that structure G is going to be a, a monoid record. And then the, that, that, so this is sort of a, a fixed parameter for the locale. And then the locale axiomatic assumptions are gonna be closure of the multiplication operation, um, associativity, closure of the one object, and the one object sort of behaves under multiplication the way we'd expect it to. And so now if we produce new theorems and new definitions and proofs in this locale, all of these axiomatic assumptions are just kind of there in the background. And, and sort of this is just further examples of locales. And, and all I really wanna point out here is that like records, locales uh, have a hierarchical structure 
and they can extend one another. So if I have a whole bunch of theorems that I proved in my monoid lo locale about, lo about monoids, and then I define this locale called group, which extends the monoid uh, locale to include the assumption that, that everything in the, the carrier set is a unit, well then, then I automatically inherit you know, every theorem about a monoid is a theorem about a group, and I can prove more theorems about groups as well. And, and a very similar thing could be done for rings. Okay, so now at this point, I wanna get into uh, sort of a little bit about what I did with Isabel and, and some applications of some of the, the concepts we've seen so far. So I'm gonna kind of go over a little bit how you could uh, formalize the, the ring of p-adic integers in, in the Isabel language. So, so the standard textbook definition of the p-adic integers is as an inverse limit of, of residue rings. So that is set theoretically speaking, right, functions from the natural numbers into residue rings, which are sort of consistent on taking, uh, taking residues. So if I take the, the residue of the, the nth thing in this tuple, uh, then I get the nth thing in the tuple if I reduce it mod n. Um, and then of course, all the operations and, and constants and everything are defined component-wise. So, so a definition like this that you might see in a textbook, uh, sort of in the framework that we've built up so far, can be translated relatively easily into Isabel. So right here, this, this would sort of, this is, this is how you could define uh, the set of p-adic numbers, right? That's functions from the natural numbers to the integers, um, such that f of m is always in the residue ring p to the m. So here we're identifying z mod p to the m z with just the numbers zero through p to the m minus one, um, such that when I take residues, we have this, Sort of coherence condition satisfied, right? So, so the kind of interesting thing we see here is that in a lot of cases, Isabel is, is sort of sufficiently expressive that we can really sort of just verbatim translate ordinary math concepts into this, and Isabel knows what we're talking about. We can define addition in sort of a similar way, define this function called p adic add, which will take our prime p as a, as a parameter, right? So it can be the addition function for, for all p adic rings at once. Um, and we could define it this way, and we can do the same thing with the other operations as well. Um, but, but importantly, at this point, like all we've done is define them, and, and so we still have to sort of prove that these behave the way that we want them to. Uh, but having defined all these operations then, and constructing the p-adics, now we can actually build a record for the p-adics, right? And so this record is of ring type. Now, p-adic int is just sort of a type, so, so this is sort of an example, right, where we this is a, a, a type synonym that I constructed where a p adic int type really is just something that maps um, natural numbers to integers, right? So it's kind of like one of these functions right here. So it's a ring built up out of a, a set of those things where the carrier is p adic set, multiplication is p adic melt, and so on, right? So, so first you have to construct all these operations and then you can just sort of, in, in a really straightforward way, assemble them into a a ring data structure. And then having done that, then we can sort of within Isabel formulate the theorem that, that this ring so constructed is an example of an integral domain. And then we can produce a proof of that. Um, so, so we can also use, so clearly, p-adic int p will be an example of the, lo the, the ring locale, um, but, but we can also build sort of a custom locale for the p-adics uh, so that gives us a convenient context for proving theorems about it. So you don't necessarily want to preface all of your theorems with like, assume that p is a prime, then blah, 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 because we always want p to be a prime. And maybe we don't want to write p-adic int p all the time either, because that's a little cumbersome. Um, so we can just sort of fix some permanent notation and definitions in a locale, and then we can just build a context there, there where we can prove p-adic theorems and we don't sort of need this sort of assumption overhead uh, prefacing every single definition and, and lemma that we want to make. And having constructed this locale for reasoning about the p-adics, we can also extend it on demand. So for example, if we want to prove Hensel's lemma, well, Hensel's lemma, we don't just want to have a p-adic ring fixed in the background. We also want to fix some particular polynomial that we want to uh, that we want to find a root of. We want to fix some particular p-adic integer which which lives near the root we want to find, 
And then we're going to make some, some axiomatic assumptions about, about that polynomial and that point A. And so we can extend the p-adic integer locale if we wanted to prove Hensel's lemma to some generic context where we've got all these things. And then we can build up Hensel's lemma through sublemmas and stuff um, in, in a sort of cleaner way than having to, every time we want to formulate a new lemma towards Hensel's lemma, having to make all of these assumptions all over again. Okay, so this is just really brief overview of sort of how day-to-day -day working in Isabel uh, goes. And so from here, I wanna sort of shift discussion a little bit to, to the actual result that, that I formalized in Isabel, which is McIntyre's theorem. So again, I assume most people are familiar with, with McIntyre's theorem for the piatics, but, but I'll just state it again. So, so essentially, if we take the language of fields, um, as well as a unary predicate, which we're going to interpret as the valuation ring of, of a valued field. And then we also introduce uh, countably many predicates, p sub n, one for every uh, natural number bigger than two, which will be interpreted as picking out those elements of our field, which are nth powers. Uh, McIntyre showed that the complete theory of QP uh, in this language uh, has quantifier elimination. Um, so, I mean, my, my motivation for picking this theorem was I was interested in sort of seeing, well, what, what p-adic model theory could I, could I produce in Isabel? And, and sort of it's pretty clear when you start thinking about it that if you want to do any p-adic model theory in Isabel, you probably have to, have to start by proving this theorem. Um, so so that, that's sort of why I picked it. Um, but the, the actual proof of this theorem that McIntyre offered is, is fairly model theoretic. It involves um, notions like the compactness theorem and saturated models. And so that proof may not be so suitable to, to formalization in Isabel because you'd sort of have to incur a lot of logical overhead um, uh, in terms of formalization to sort of get yourself to the point where you could, could reproduce that logic. So instead, um, I, I used as sort of a, a scaffold for my formalization, a, a proof of McIntyre's theorem that's due to Deneff. Uh, so, so in 1986, Deneff published a proof of McIntyre's theorem that, that is sort of not model theoretic, right? It's, it's an entirely algebraic proof uh, that, that doesn't really use any concepts from logic at all. Um, and, and so I figured less conceptual overhead probably means that this would be an easier way to go about getting this result uh, in Isabel. So yeah, like I said, Deneff's proofs, totally algebraic. And, and basically uh, just to give a very, very broad sketch of how, how Deneff's proof of, of McIntyre's theorem goes. Well, so, so first Deneff defines what we call semi-algebraic sets and semi-algebraic functions, which correspond in, in McIntyre's language to those sets and functions, which are definable in a quantifier free way. Uh, but, but Deneff gives a definition that doesn't sort of refer to a language, right? So just sort of the algebraic analog of what that would be. Um, and then shows that, that all sort of basic constructions, uh, such as the valuation on the, the piatic field can be defined as, as semi-algebraic relations. Here, you make extensive use of Hensel's lemma. Uh, from there, Deneff proves two sort of related uh, cell decomposition theorems, which sort of state, you know, given certain polynomials and under certain conditions, we can, we can decompose uh, powers of, of QP into special semi-algebraic sets called cells uh, that, that are sort of play nicely with, with the polynomials that we're decomposing them relative to. Uh, and then finally, with, with these cell decomposition theorems, he's able to sort of give a, a, a relatively elementary proof of McIntyre's theorem. And now, of course, since we're doing this in a non-logical way, the way that we formulate McIntyre's theorem has to be that semi-algebraic sets are closed under projections, uh, you know, just so there's no reference to actual quantifiers. Okay, so from here, I'm going to go into just a few of the details, um, uh, basically just statements of, of the different results that, uh, that Deneff needs to come up with this proof. Uh, but my focus isn't so much going to be on the content of these results and, and talking about the structure of the proof. Uh, more of my focus is going to be on the mathematical vocabulary 
that, that you need to be able to express these ideas in a formal setting. Because, because really, I mean, once, you've, once you're sort of formulating a paper, the, the main challenge isn't, isn't the argument because you've got the argument. Uh, that Denef already wrote the argument for me. Uh, the, the challenge is, is sort of building up this minimal vocabulary where I can recapitulate the reasoning that, that's being done in an informal way in the paper into, into the formal language in Isabel. So, so first of all, uh, we'll just look at, at Deneff's notion of semi-algebraic sets. So, so Deneff defines a semi-algebraic set as a Boolean combination of sets of the following form. And you can see what these sets really are is just an inverse image of one of McIntyre's P sub N sets uh, under a, a polynomial over our field. Oh, and sorry, I wrote K there, but, but I should have written QP. Um, and then he defines a semi-algebraic function as, as just a function whose, well, this is sort of, I, I don't know if there's sort of a name for what this is. I guess it's sort of like a partial inverse image, um, but uh, for, for sets which are sort of like inverse images of semi-algebraic sets. Uh, so if you have a function whose inverse image of semi-algebraic sets are again semi-algebraic, we call that a semi-algebraic function but we're also sort of allowing this extra variable y here, right? Because if we just made it um, that their, their inverse image of semi-algebraic sets was semi-algebraic, we wouldn't be capturing all the possible quantifier free definable functions in the McIntyre language. But when we add this extra variable, then we are. Um, okay. And now, finally, uh, so, oh, sorry, okay. So, so that's semi-algebraic sets and semi-algebraic functions. Uh, from there, Deneff also sort of defines this notion of a cell. And so I won't really get too much, too much into these, but, but obviously they're important because uh, they're, they're what we're decomposing basic sets into. Uh, but then finally, the, the cell decomposition theorems. So, so Deneff proves two of these. The first of them says that we can decompose uh, a power of QP cross QP into, into finitely many cells relative to some polynomial F. And now this polynomial F is a single variable polynomial whose coefficients are semi-algebraic um, in, in such a way that, that the valuation of F at any particular point in one of these cells is, is sort of close to, well, the, the smallest of the, the valuations of the terms. So, so it's just the valuation of F can be understood in terms of the valuation, the valuation of each term in a, in a Taylor expansion of F. And then the second theorem is, is sort of similar uh, where we're preparing QP into a cell decomposition relative to a set of polynomials in such a way that these polynomials factor in a, in a sort of nice way on each of the pieces in that decomposition. So again, the content's not so important but, but just the fact that, that we need this vocabulary about semi-algebraic polynomials is, is sort of what's, what's more important and also what causes more headaches in, in trying to formalize this. Okay, so, so from here, we can kind of just prepare a list of, of sort of conceptual things that need to be formalized in Isabel before we can really start talking about Deneff's proof, right? So first we've got to construct ZP and we've got to construct QP. So, so when I first started this project, like nobody had done that before. And so, so these sort of libraries had to be built from scratch. Um, obviously we need to, Isabel needs to be able to reason about single variable polynomials over some base ring. Uh, so, so quite a bit of work had to be done to build up sort of generic libraries with theorems about polynomials over a base ring, uh, including like the derivative of a polynomial, taking Taylor expansions of polynomials, things like that. So, so a lot of the work there is really kind of just writing what you might find in a really basic algebra textbook into, into Isabel form and, and producing proofs of all that. Um, finally, uh, all, all kinds of places in this theorem proof use, use Hensel's lemma. So, so we needed to be able to formulate and then prove Hensel's lemma um, in, in Isabel. Obviously that proof is going to draw heavily on these last two points um, in order to do that. Uh, finally, we, we need to talk about multivariable polynomials. And at the time when I started this, there were sort of limited libraries 
available in Isabel for, for talking about multivariable polynomials in the context of, of the algebra libraries. So, so I had to do quite a bit of work uh, to, to just build up the general theory of multivariable polynomials uh, to be able to, to sort of produce the argument. Also, Cartesian powers of a ring. This was <laughs> a really basic thing. If I've got a ring, then, then I've got some, some related object, which is that ring to the n. Uh, there wasn't really very much available at the time in that, and so, so quite a bit had to be done there. Um, also, since we're talking about semi-algebraic functions, uh, sort of the general concept that I can start with some set and have a base ring, and then there's always going to be a ring of functions from that set to that ring, and, and the sort of fundamental properties that that has uh, needed to be formalized. Uh, and then finally, to define uh, semi-algebraic sets, uh, we, we needed this general notion of Boolean algebras of sets, which are generated by some basic type of set. Uh, so, so all of this work had to be done just basically as sort of a precursor, right? None of this really involves the content of the paper. This is just sort of the conceptual framework that had to be built up to be able to, to use the vocabulary of the paper in Isabel. Okay. Uh, so okay, from, from here, I'll, I'll get into some of the particulars that needed to be done sort of for, for the, the, the actual details of the paper itself. Um, so let me go back for just a second to, to let's say here, right? So, so in the statement of the first Selby composition theorem, um, the statement is essentially about a polynomial with coefficients, which are semi-algebraic functions. And that polynomial, uh, if I take some arbitrary semi-algebraic function C, it can sort of be decomposed into a, a Taylor expansion. Uh, and then the old coefficients of the polynomial change to these new coefficients AI. So just to be able to talk about something like that, it became clear pretty quickly that, that we, we don't just need to formalize semi-algebraic functions, but we really need to think about semi-algebraic functions as for forming a ring unto themselves because then all these basic facts, like you can take Taylor expansions and, and things like that can be imported immediately to the context of semi-algebraic functions. Um, so, so sort of past these sort of basic concepts here, the first thing I had to do was construct a ring consisting of all semi-algebraic functions and then proving sort of the basic properties of that ring. Um, and one of the more irritating aspects of that was dealing with division by semi-algebraic functions. So obviously, uh, if a semi-algebraic function is zero or is non-zero everywhere, right, then as a function, it has a multiplicative inverse. And it's not too hard to, to prove that, that that resulting thing is also semi-algebraic. On the other hand, though, a lot of the time in, in arguments such as Deneff's, when you're talking about cell decompositions and polynomials, you have a function which may or may not be non-zero everywhere, uh, but you only care about it on a particular subset for which you know it to be non-zero. And of course, locally inverting that function is no problem um, in an informal sense. Uh, in a formal sense, you have to sort of make a decision on what you mean by dividing by it. So if we take this sort of excerpt from, from Deneff's paper here, for example, right, this is the kind of argument you see all the time when, when you're thinking about like cell decompositions in a piadic context. So we've got some set and we partition that set such that some, for some set of functions AI, all of them is either identically zero or never zero on that set. And then once we've done that, well, for, for each of these AIs that are never zero on that set, we're gonna treat it like it's a function unit, right? We can divide by it and one over AI, we, we might as well treat it as if it's also a semi-algebraic function. Now, from the context of having built up this ring of semi-algebraic functions, it's not totally clear on how to do that because, because if this AI is zero somewhere else, then formally speaking, it doesn't have an inverse there. And so there's these kind of annoying technical details that have to be introduced to, to deal with these problems. Uh, so, so this, I mean, because the conceptually the answer is sort of, well, okay, we can invert it there and semi-algebraic functions are actually closed under sort of piecewise constructions. So if I want, if I, if I don't care about what AI of X is outside of the set A, then I might as well just pretend 
like, like it is equal to something that's never zero there uh, and sort of proceed with my argument. And so you can construct a generic function that if you input some F, then it will create, well, fun glue is just the name that I gave for, for piecewise construction, uh, piecewise function construction. And so on this set, the non-zero set of F, we're gonna take the values of the function F and outside of there, we're gonna take the values of the, the constant function one. And then you can prove that that thing is always a unit. You can also, we also then have to prove it sort of explicitly a theorem that says, well, if I take a point that's in this set that we're gluing along, then this thing will agree with the values of F. And then if you wanna state something like this, really, you don't wanna say AJ of X over AI of X. You wanna say AJ of X over two fun unit AI of X. And then later on, if you want some sort of value uh, or like pointwise statement to be made about it, you just know that the values of those two functions are the same in the context you care about it. But, but the need to do that gets, gets quite tedious. And that, that was one of the more, more irritating uh, obstacles I encountered uh, trying, trying to sort of rebuild some of these algebraic arguments. Um, so next point I really want to draw attention to are some challenges that were presented by, by polynomials. So, so obviously uh, in mathematics, we're used to sort of thinking about multivariable polynomials in a number of different ways. Uh, and that can be illustrated here uh, by this sort of passage from, from Deneff's proof. So here, uh, and again, the, the content of this doesn't matter so much. I just want to draw attention to a couple of uh, a couple of different points in here. So we've got a polynomial f here, and then we'll say f is a polynomial in one variable t with coefficients, which are semi-algebraic functions. And then we're going to do Euclidean division of this function f of y t by a function g of y t to get a new polynomial. And so the the point I want to draw attention to in a passage like this is. So first, when f is first introduced, it's a defining parameter for a semi-algebraic set, which means that it's a polynomial in r plus one variables over qp. Then on the very next line, f now needs to be a polynomial in one variable with semi-algebraic coefficients. Now those, those semi-algebraic coefficients will again be polynomials, but polynomials are semi-algebraic. So, so we need to be able to, in the same breath, think of it as a single variable polynomial uh, over the ring of semi-algebraic functions in R variables, where R is sort of the length of the variable Y. And then we're doing Euclidean division a, a paragraph later. Um, so, so now it's a single variable polynomial of the ring of semi-algebraic functions, but in the variable Y comma, or X comma Y, which is R plus M variables. Um, so, so this, uh, a big obstacle that I encountered in, in formalizing things like this was just that we, we need to sort of be able to, to take an object, a polynomial f, and very, very quickly cast it into all these different roles that it might have to play, sort of knowing that the relevant data, like, you know, when you evaluate it to an actual number, it, it sort of gives the same answer no matter how you cast it. Um, and, and so this was, this was a big challenge in, in sort of, because what is very easy to say in, in ordinary language becomes quite delicate to say when you have to make all of these considerations just within this one paragraph. Um, so I'll just sort of talk a little bit about how one can, can sort of efficiently solve that problem. Uh, and it's with just universal properties for polynomials. So there's this sort of well-known universal property that, that polynomial rings over a commutative ring have. So if I've got polynomials in variables i over a commutative ring r, and then I've got a ring morphism from, from, a, from ring R to some other ring S and a variable assignment function that assigns each of the variables in the set I a value in S, then I can always find like a unique ring morphism uh, from R of I to S that extends both of these things. Um, so it turns out that, that once we prove uh, a theorem like this in Isabel, which is what this is down here, then that can give us some of the, the conceptual framework to, to make sense of, of all of this, right? So if I've got a polynomial in R plus one variables, well, I can map QP into the ring of semi-algebraic functions uh, just by inclusion as constant functions. And I can map all but one of these R variables uh, to projection functions, and then we get the mapping of those into semi-algebraic functions. 
And then by giving, by giving a map from QP into the ring of semi-algebraic functions and giving a map from each of the variables to there, we can just use this theorem to automatically say, okay, well, this amalgamates to, to this inclusion that, that allows us to think about this F as, as an element of, or of semi-algebraic polynomials. And, and similar constructions can be done for, for most of these ways that we may want to recast these things. And it, it gets a little tedious, um, but, but, but as far as I can tell, uh, that, or as, as far as I could tell, that this was the, the most efficient way I could come up with to sort of to, to deal with those types of arguments. Okay, um, and there's really just one kind of last point I want to draw attention to. Like, this hasn't been anything like an exhaustive list of the the sort of challenges or, or sort of design considerations going into it. This is more just kind of giving a flavor for like what, yeah, what what kinds of uh, solutions are needed to to solve these like really really sort of basic reasoning problems that come up when you're trying to 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 translate uh, a paper like this into a formal setting. Um, so lots of lines like this end up sort of causing the biggest headaches, right? These, these throwaway lines that we've all put into our own mathematical writing where we just say, well, this fact's trivial, so we're not gonna prove it, uh, but we're gonna use it a lot. And a lot of the time that sort of can function as a code for the proof of this fact is not very interesting and it would be tedious to write down. Uh, so of course, if you're trying to formalize something like this in, in a language like Isabel, this is, this is never an option, right? Everything you wanna use has to actually be, be very precisely formulated and very precisely proved. And, and one of the challenges I encountered was like very often this can sort of result in enormous proofs by cases that, that, that get very technical and tedious. So for this particular thing, um, the way this can end up being formalized in, in the language of Isabel is, well, first we need a predicate that describes a set which can, which is a, well, which can be partitioned into a finite number of cells all with the same center C. So that's gonna be this thing over here, which we call is C decomposable. So Y is C decomposable if there exists a cell decomposition of Y and every cell in that cell decomposition has the center C. So once we've done that, now we can formulate and prove a theorem in Isabel, which, looks more or less like the statement up here, but it says, okay, well, if I have a, okay, so th this is slightly different, but, but essentially what this is saying here is all sets or all subsets of some set C, which are C decomposable, that class of sets is the same as the Boolean algebra generated by cells, which are subsets of that set C and have the center little C. So, so once we prove a theorem like that, then, then that effectively captures this. And every time we want to use this trivial fact without the, that, that's not necessarily getting mentioned, that, that actually has to turn into an explicit invocation of this, often with a little sub-argument explaining exactly how this theorem sort of pertains to the context where it's being used. And, and that does sort of start to incur significant overhead in terms of ballooning the length of some of these proofs. This thing itself was pretty irritating to prove as well because I mean, essentially, I, I think you might be able to sort of guess how it would go, right? You, you need to take, okay, well, if I take two cells and I intersect them, can that be decomposed? If I take their set difference, can that be decomposed? And then we have to think of all the different kinds of cells that, that we might be encountering and sort of do this long, long case distinction about how the boundaries of the cells change as we make these Boolean combinations. And it is 110 lines here, but but I'm sort of embarrassed to say the actual cumulative proof of this ended up being about a thousand lines, um, just of sort of like case distinction lemmas uh, leading up to that. Okay, I think that I may have gone a little faster than I thought. Um, no, no, I think I'm doing okay. So that's really all I wanted to say about, uh, about this formalization, uh, just to sort of it, it, the actual details of what goes into it, I, I, I admit I had a bit of a hard time sort of compressing all into a talk uh, that, that sort of 
gave everybody a sense of like both what I did, but then also sort of like what what these uh, Isabel tools are. If you don't have familiarity with them, it's hard to, to succinctly describe it. Um, but from here, all I'm just gonna comment on are sort of some directions that I think that I might like to take this project. So having, having finished the formalization of McIntyre's theorem, there's, there's all kinds of different theorems that, that I'd like to be able to formalize uh, from the, the area of piadic model theory into, into Isabel. So, so first of all, uh, the Neff's paper that I used as sort of my reference material, uh, it was for a general finite extension of QP and, and essentially out of sort of not wanting to do a whole little uh, foray into finite extensions of QP in Isabel as well, I, I just sort of restricted attention instead to that field itself, but, but certainly this work could be expanded to generalize the result. Um, I think it'd be very interesting as well to, to try to uh, broaden this, this ring of semi-algebraic functions I constructed in QP to also include analytic functions. And then, uh, so try, try to formalize cell decomposition and quantifier elimination theorems uh, for, for those structures as well. Um, and having done that, I mean, some, some pretty, I guess these results here that we've proved, um, maybe they're interesting to this sort of very niche subset of people who are both interested in automated theorem proving and interested in piadic model theory. Um, but but if, I, if I sort of wanted to take these and, and sort of add to the Isabel libraries, uh, things that are of much more general interest, that then this would all, could also be sort of a springboard for if you wanted to try to formalize uh, uh, arithmetic motivic integration uh, in the sort of vein of Cluckers and Lazare. So if we wanted to start talking about how can we use these cell decomposition theorems to, to construct motivic piadic integrals and, and compute their values, uh, I, I think that would be an interesting project. Uh, <laughs> I. Having done this one, I imagine it would be a lot of work, uh, but, but, but it's something that I would like to try to do. And then finally, uh, moving in a slightly different direction, uh, sort of abstract away from this and say, really the work we've done here is just a specific example of a P-minimal structure. Uh, so, so P-minimal structures are sort of the P-adic analog of O-minimality. And so using, using the locale construction, we could also define what it means for a field along with a, a class of sets for every dimension for that field uh, to, be, to be P minimal, and then prove that the P addicts as constructed here are an example of that. And then we could prove lots of theorems in the, in the general theory of P minimality as well. Um, so I think that that's all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, Thanks everybody for listening. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions? So you mentioned it briefly before, um, why use Isabel and not other tools? I mean, you, you said that Isabel are some, somehow it's, it could be harder to use and you have some constraints. So why is it, why is Isabel? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, um, this was the first theorem prover I learned. Um, and, and a lot of this work sort of came out of me wanting to find a project just so I could learn more of it. Um, so, so yeah, and on, on the one hand, um, I would say that it it was because it was what I knew and it was building on stuff uh, that I already knew I had limited exposure to, to other their improvers, but, but I certainly wouldn't say that this couldn't be done in, in lean or Coke as well. Um, yeah, I guess that's not, not necessarily a, a, a very satisfactory answer, but. Um, oh, no, it's good. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, I, I just want to uh, say that I'm quite, quite impressed with uh, uh, you doing all that, particularly as um, so I have done some things in lean and I feel like uh, a lot of the background stuff that you had to do before really getting to this particular theorem uh, 
would have all, has already been done there. So I'm very impressed with starting at that point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess my hope is that uh, the next person that tries to do something like this won't have to do quite so much work. Uh, yeah, sorry. I've my actual question popped back into my head. Um, oh, okay. So for uh, you, you mentioned in like one of the first slides some logic flavored results that have popped up from time to time that aren't exactly model theory, but seem like they would have to use at least some of the some description of first order logic, like the completeness theorem and probably some of the independence results. Um, do you have any idea how, like, if those frameworks for logic and Isabel would actually be compatible with, you know, saying what definable means in this context? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so those results there, so, so yeah, I, I sort of really glossed over something at the beginning was this distinction between Isabel and Isabel slash Hall. Um, so, so what I'm doing here is uh, higher order logic, and that tends to be an easier logic to work in if you want to, to talk about lots of ordinary mathematical structures, groups, rings, fields, stuff like that. Um, the other, those, those other logic theorems, uh, to my knowledge, those were actually done in a, in a different sort of variant on Isabel, which is called Isabel ZF. And so there, the underlying logic is not a higher order logic. The underlying logic is just first order logic with the, the zermelo frankel set theory axioms. And so, so the, the kind of underlying logic for proving those is kind of a, a separate thing. Um, so, so that is obviously, uh, it's a context where, where it's a lot easier to translate set theory results and, and a lot of logic results as well, because a lot of these things, the, the ordinary mathematical formulations of them is set theoretic. Uh, if you're working in higher order logic, it becomes a little trickier to do. Um, for, for one, because, uh, well, because that's just not the framework that these are usually formulated in. And also because there's these enormous ZF libraries have been written, right? So these independence results, though, those are done in Isabel ZF. And, and there, are, there are ways that you can import results from one to another, but it's not always entirely straightforward. I see. So the, the, the whole first order formalism is just baked right into the language there, rather than being something that you could import and say in your higher order logic, this is first order definable. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, you could use like records, for example, right, to keep track of all the different syntactic objects in a first order language and, and try, try to sort of do that. And I, I have uh, to, to not that much success. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it, it proved to be, I mean, I, I'd already made enough work for myself and, uh, re really, I haven't at least had time to really pursue that line too much. All right. Thanks. Are there any other questions? So thank you very much again for this talk. Thank you. Next week, we will have two sessions of the seminars. There will be the usual session with uh, Nadav Meyer. And on the 4th of November, there will be an extra session at 2 p.m. with David Merker. Dave Merker. Yeah.